on Mars and Amphibians. So hello everyone, my name is Elisa Venture and I'm a PhD candidate at um, UC Berkeley with Professor Mike Boots. And today I'm going to be talking to you about a project that I'm currently finishing up in the lab titled Killing Those You Know, Host Phenotype Specialization in an Insect Pathogen. So first, I want to introduce the team of researchers who contribute to this project. Um, that's me up there and my professor, Mike Boots. Lewis Bartlett has helped with some of the stats. And I've had a team of Berkeley undergraduates, including Nicole Denamer, Aaron Yarkin, and Dina Al-Hassani, who have helped collect a lot of the data for this project. So the main question of my project was, can we experimentally evolve a granulosis virus to specialize on specific genotypes of a moth host? For anyone impatient out there, the answer is yes. <laughs> but I'll get more into that later. First, I want to break down this question a bit. Central to this project is this idea of specializing on specific genotypes of a host. This question of host specialization essentially boils down to a problem of niche breath evolution. So what is niche breath evolution? The central question of niche breath evolution is why isn't everything a generalist? Clearly, it would be the best for an organism to just be the best at everything at Earth. But in a costless situation, that would lead to one super fit species, and that's clearly not what we see out in nature. So MacArthur applied a classic proverb to this problem by saying that the jack of all trades is a master of none, or essentially that a generalist must be mediocre on any one environment compared to a specialist on that environment. So this phenomenon of mediocre generalists could arise from a number of mechanisms. The first is the trade-off theory proposed by Levitz in 1968. It argues that there are direct correlations between fitnesses on different environments, such that an increase in fitness on one environment comes at a cost of decreased fitness on another. This theory has been well applied to host parasite evolution by a number of groups who show that the shape of the trade-off, the type of heterogeneity, and the degree of mixing or migration between the two host types can all affect whether a heterogeneous host population selects for specialists or generalists. The next theory is the mutation accumulation theory proposed by Whitlock and Kwecki that comes from observations that fitnesses on different environments do not always directly trade off with each other. And so they instead argue that generalists are less able to maintain their genetic quality across all environments in the face of deleterious mutation pressure. So why do we actually care about niche breath evolution? Niche breath ev evolution underpins a huge number of our other theories in, ecolog in ecology and evolution. First, we see that niche breath evolution will affect disease ecology and evolution. So parasites that are specific to different genotypes um, can lead to different disease ecology. So Elton first noticed this in crop monocultures, which are essentially genetically homogenous um, populations. And he saw that these crop monocultures had higher infectious disease burdens and hypothesized that this was because they were being released from the trade-off of having to adapt to multiple host genotypes. Second, we see that a parasite's host genotype specificity affects host evolution. So the red queen hypothesis of sex, which you guys might have heard about quite a bit here, theorizes that genotype-specific parasites can select for sexual reproduction in their hosts as a way to quickly generate new rare genotypes that are outside of the niche breath of current parasites. And finally, niche breath coevolution more generally across all biotic interactions underpins most of our theories for why we have such high diversity on Earth. So clearly niche breath evolution is super important, but there's still a number of outstanding questions about how heterogeneous populations select on niche breath and what ecological conditions shape that, and also questions about how universal these costs to generalism or trade-offs actually are. And so with our question for this experiment about whether we could experimentally evolve genotype specialists in our system, we'll be hopefully gathering a little bit more data about how universal these trade-offs are. So first I want to introduce my last model system. We use the Plodia intercomptella and Plodia intercomptella granulosis virus system. So Plodia intercomptella, that kind of 
giraffe-looking moth over there is also known as the Indian meal moth. And if you've ever had moths invade your pantry, um, they're pretty gross, and that would be these ones. So it's actually really useful for our purposes because that means that we can do population level ecology and evolution studies in an animal and their laboratory conditions that are essentially that organism's natural environment because we can make our lab look a lot like a pantry. <laughs> <laughs> this system is also really great currently because Lewis Bartlett and others have just made a number of inbred genotypes of our moth host, and the, that should mean that we essentially have 13 pretty much clonal populations of different genotypes. And the virus, oops, the virus that we use is the floating interfunctella granulosis virus, and this is a double-stranded DNA baculovirus. And an important thing about it is that it's an obligate killer, which means that it needs to kill its host in order to transmit. And so infection is this very binary metric of you are either infected and dead and infectious, or you're totally fine and have a normal life history. And transmission happens when larvae orally ingest the virus during larval cannibalism of infected cadavers. So clearly the reason that I'm in this session is that I've used an experimental evolution approach to see whether we could evolve host genotype specialists. And the way that I've done this is that I've used these inbred lines that we have in the lab to choose three, of, three different inbred lines, so three different genotypes, and I've serially passaged virus on these three different host genotypes. And I have three replicate lineages on each one of these. And we've, so we've serially passaged for nine generations on these three host genotypes. And we've chosen these host genotypes to have similar levels of resistance at the start of the experiment. And so that should hopefully allow us to distinguish a little bit more between evolution that's happening in response to the specific genetic interactions between host and genotype which should lead to negative fitness correlations across genotypes versus evolution that's happening in response to the overall resistance level of the host, which would lead to positive genetic correlations. So for our passaging protocol, we're using oral inoculations, and we orally inoculate third and star larvae with a set dose of virus that kills 50% of larvae at the start of the experiment. After we inoculate the larvae, we incubate them for 20 days, and then we harvest the virus from 10 infected larvae of each virus line by homogenizing the tissue, centrifuging it, and <coughs> semi-purifying it in a 0.65 micron filter. We then count the virus and dilute it back to the standard pathogen dose across all of our lineages, and inoculate the next set of third and star larvae with this dose, um, again, for nine passages. At the end of the experiment, we've measured changes in fitness on a number of different metrics. So we've inoculated all three of our host genotypes with all nine <coughs> of our virus lineages. And so by assaying every virus line on every host genotype, we have a fully crossed assay scheme that we can use to test for how the fitness of the virus changes on the host genotype that is being evolved on and the unfamiliar host lines. So for each assay infection, we've measured both the proportion of larvae infected, and we can tell infected and uninfected larvae apart because the infected ones turn a bright, chalky white and die, and that's just because the virus has just filled up their entire body. Um, so that means we don't have to do any genetics, and it's really cheap. <laughs> and we've also measured the average viral, viral replication, and so from each assay plate that we've counted the proportion infected on, we collect all of the infected larvae and pool them together and then extract all the virus from those and count it on a Petrofhauser counting chamber. And so that will give us a count of the average number of virions produced per infected cadaver for each host genotype um, and evolved on a combination. So now let's get down to the actual results. Generally, the takeaway here is that we do see that evolved vi virus performs better when it's infecting the familiar host genotype than when it's infecting unfamiliar host genotypes. So the first metric of proportion infected, we see that viruses infect a higher proportion of hosts when they're infecting the genotype that they were evolved on than when they're infecting unfamiliar ones. Um, 
Um, so these graphs are all model, uh, model coefficients for the effect size from the GLMM. And they're all looking at this binary trait of is the line that you're infecting the line that you were evolved on? And so true is yes, false is no. We next see that viruses have higher viral, viral replication when infecting the familiar line. And then we also look at an overall fitness metric where we multiply together the proportion infected by the virus replication. And again, viruses are better at the familiar host genotype. So this is all for this, that binary trait of self versus other. And we next wanted to see if there were effects of the specific combination between the genotypes that you were evolved on and that you're infecting. So we broke up our statistical model to test that directly, and we didn't see any effect on proportion infected. That binary model was still the best, but we do see that this specific combination model is better for both virus count and overall fitness, and a lot of that is being driven um, by these viruses up here. So this one on the far left, is the virus that was evolved on host line 17 and is being assayed on host line 17. And we, for some reason, see that virus evolved on host line 17 evolved really high viral replication. And that's most obvious on their familiar line, um, this really, really high dot. But we also see that this virus has the highest viral replication on an unfamiliar line, um, host genotype 9. And so we actually see in overall fitness that 17 was the best at nine. So in conclusion, our experiment showed that we can evolve granulosis virus to be host genotype specialists, showing that there seems to be a trade-off between host genotypes in our model system. And this existence of these trade-offs means that we can ask further questions about niche breath evolution in the Podiotipophila and granulosis virus model system. And so with that, I'd like to thank you all for listening and ask if anyone has any questions. A lot of those went extinct because of immune depression, um, but now we have, I think, 12 or 13 pretty stable lines. And we're actually in the process of assaying those all for resistance and development time right now because they were actually made for a different experiment. And there's a huge variety of resistance and development time combinations. Um, we haven't specifically sequenced them and looked at it that way, but there at least is a lot of phenotypic diversity. as these occlusion bodies, which are protein-coded. Um, if you want to fix that up. Um, anyway, it needs to infect or not by passing the gut barrier. Um, and if anyone has any further questions, I've set up my poster downstairs, and I'll be at the poster session this evening. I would love to